Hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I've been a fan of Rose's work for a long time and been very much aware of her as a mover and a shaker in terms of uh, filmmaking in the lesbian world and in the, in the broader world as well. She, of course, is a, a, a legendary lesbian. Um, many of us... <laughs> do you like that title? Are you comfortable with that? I, I don't... Uh, I'm locked in, I guess. <laughs> You're stuck with it. That's You're the hard part, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's just like... Mm. Um, Rose has been called the poster girl for lesbian cinema, uh, especially since her independent feature film, Go Fish, broke, out through, bro broke through at the Sundance Film Festival in 1994. Go Fish was real, it was celebratory, and it was enormously good-humoured. A big factor behind it scoring a big sale to Goldwyn and being released in US cinemas. It went on to become one of the festival favourites of the year, winning the Teddy Award for Gay Cinema at the Berlin Film Festival, and its legendary status still lives on. Rose continued to build on her filmmaking skills and create a diverse array of characters with the feature films, Bedrooms and Hallways, and The Safety of Objects. And then she moved into episodic television, which brings us to, drumroll, the L word. <laughs> which was groundbreaking for the way it put a group of middle-class women centre frame in a series, women who just happened to be having sex with each other. <laughs> and a lot of sex. Uh, this, the show was hugely successful. It first played on US cable channel Showtime, but was popular across the world. And the box sets, of course, have been very much in circulation, um, changing hands over and over again. I hope you, know, you, you know you all just bought one set and then you've just been <laughs> circulating it between that, you. That's, that's, the like the, that's the lesbian that's way. That's the lesbian way, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and now, very interestingly, uh, Rose has, has moved into a new form of storytelling, which is the virtual reality space, which is one of the reasons that you're here in Sydney and was invited to Australia. So would you please give Rose Trochet a massive Sydney welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th they, thank you for coming out. Wow, that's very, very nice of you. Thanks for the massive Sydney welcome. We're all very happy to be here. Yeah. Um, now, I'm kind of interested because I think um, we could start with Go Fish, but it's probably, probably, I think, quite instructive to go back a bit before that. Given your background, you were born in Chicago in 1964. Mm. I'm very interested <coughs> to know... <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, oops, oops. <laughs> I was born in 61, so that, yeah, yeah, that puts you at ease. When did the sort of wheels start to turn in terms of your interest in filmmaking? And, and when did you start to sort of find your way out of those kind of cultural and um, parental expectations? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. Uh, I thought we were here to have fun. Uh, but um, let me try to No, that. not with me, darling. I'll no, no I'm all serious now. Uh, I know. <laughs> she is. Let's see. Yeah, it was, uh, both my parents are from Puerto Rico. Uh, I grew up uh, in Chicago, um, which is a very racist city. You know, it, the, really the, the, the kind of goal for, for my parents who were like sixth grade and ninth grade educated were really to kind of have kids that would, that would graduate from high school, would potentially go on to college. Well, that's a classic migrant thing, isn't it? That, yeah. edu that, that belief in education. Yeah. Your parents had that, because were they terribly educated themselves, or? No, sixth and ninth grade, so no. Right, no. so you, um, you were going to be the one who My would... mother was very aspirational, though. Right. Very, very aspirational. You know, listen to classical music, would like, okay. you know, kind of like, you know, have a book as a prop, you know, like, oh. you know. <laughs> <laughs> my parents had gotten divorced when I was 11, so it was just my mom. And so she didn't really know a lot about like how school worked. Like you know, chores had to come first, homework came second. And you're just like, well, but I have finals, you know, like mm. iron the clothes. Um, so there wasn't like a real understanding of like what it took to kind of be in this. But it, except there was an understanding of like you come to the U.S. to succeed. So and that a, there was that aspirational, ambitious sort of uh, expectation that was there. Yeah, but doing something in the arts was just not understood. It was just like well, that doesn't make you. Where's the money? Um, and I think, like, probably a lot of parents would have that. Yeah, my parents were the same with me. Yeah. yeah. Until I'd been doing comedy for a while and they realised it was actually yeah, a job. Yeah, they're like, there's a cha-ching at the yeah. end of that <laughs> sentence. And that's why I got into industrial design, because it had industrial in it. My mom was like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I got I, into the School of the Arts through that. The, B, B. Ruby Rich coined the term uh, new queer cinema, yeah. which you're seen as being one of the foundational members. But, of course, there was a, you know, what preceded that in terms of how... What were the circumstances that that was arising from? How old were you when you began to realise that you were a lesbian? I... You know, it was very funny, because my brother got... My brother was um, kicked out of our house for being gay um, when he was 17, a little bit... Uh, a few weeks before 
he graduated from high school. And that was, you know, really traumatic. But it was years later for me that I came out. My brother had come back, and anyway, it's, it's like a sort of a complicated circumstance where my brother had come back, my mother kicked him out again, and I was like, fuck this, I'm leaving too. And, um, and, 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 and then six months after leaving, I was like, you know, I had this whole like epiphany. And I was also, in a, I was also who took a woman's studies class and came out? Is there anybody <laughs> in here who did that? Am I the only one up in here? Wait, no, oh, there you go. My friends, there we go, you know what I mean. You know what I'm talking about. It was women in film, and that's where I met my first girlfriend. Okay. Yeah. But that, that was, I mean, it was a hard time. I mean, we're of a roughly similar age, and, and, uh, and I think um, lesbians of our generation really, I mean, it was quite brutal. It was, it was considered a psychiatric illness. It was illegal. You know, for me, hmm? at that time, because I came out when I was 22, I went straight, straight almost into uh, activism. Right. Like I was, you know, I was getting arrested and, and that kind of stuff. So I had like this, and it was a lot of it was that first girlfriend that I had. Okay, um, what, what happened who was, there? Who was, who was very much like, had been gay since um, she was 16, mm -hmm. is now a he, but um, has, was, you know, at, but in, in reference to historically, I will say she, she had been gay for a while. Yeah. So, so really was like my, the person who gave me my education, really. Yeah. And really kind of, um, uh, you know, it I don't think there was a choice but to be political if we were gonna be, be together. Yeah. And that kind of suited me just fine, you yeah. know. And so that it made it a lot easier. So we right. would go to, we would go and have like kiss-ins and like, you know, like everybody makes out with everybody else and then runs, you know. <laughs> you know, like, like you just run for your life. Or maybe I'm just revising my own history, but I, I feel less shameful and more like angry, right. I think. And right. Go Fish really comes out of that whole thing. Yeah. You were talking about women's studies, and, and Go Fish begins with an academic giving a lecture about the history of yeah, lesbianism, yeah. really. Yeah. So I've, I watched the um, YouTube clip of you and Guinevere debating the origin story of Go Fish and how that came about. She's Can you tell us a about, about that? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, she'll always. Yeah, Guinevere will always have her own uh, um, rendition. Hers is a very funny story. If she said you were watching um, that film Switch with Ellen Barkin, where yeah. she's a male who is, uh, comes back to life as a female yeah. and then goes to a lesbian club. Yeah, yeah. And she, in, in her telling of the story, you were watching the film and going, that's not like any lesbian club we've yeah. ever seen. It was a real Hollywood representation. We did literally sit down together and write everything that we didn't want the movie to be. And what sort of things were those that you didn't want the movie to be? Um, we didn't want it to end in tragedy. Yeah. We didn't want it to be. Uh, we didn't want it to be sad. We wanted it to be about us, by for. You know, it was like sort of by for and about, was yeah. really kind of the, the the basic things that we wanted to do. Yeah. And I remember because we because like later on we had to we had to change the title. The title the original title was called Eli and Max, and um, and when we got together with Christine Vashon based on the article that B Ruby Rich wrote on queer cinema, which was like, we weren't a part of that at that time. It was, it was Swoon and it was Poison, and Poison was a very influential movie for me in making Go Fish, which originally was in three parts. Was it was documentary, the interstitial, like, experimental bits, because that's how I started in film. Yeah. And then, um, and then narrative. Uh, and Ruby wrote that article, and I called everybody in that article and was like, you know, I have a film, can you watch it? And, you know, and one of the things that they said was to change the name. And I remember Guinevere and I, we were at Roscoe's in Chicago, uh, which is a gay bar. And, uh, <laughs> and we were just like, what are we gonna call this movie? And we were just like, leave it to Beaver. And we're like, let's take it, you know. <laughs> we're like, we're like uh, then we just settled on Go Fish. And we were just like, and it was one of those moments where we were just like, it means like go, like go, the card game where you try to make matches, you try to make pairs. It was like the man who, the blind man who passes the fish market and says, hello, ladies. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so we were, and, uh, and it was like throwing out a line, right? So we were like, we liked all three things and we were just like, yeah, we're gonna do that. We're gonna call it that. Did you feel very much aware of that sense of that there was the possibility that you could actually revolutionize the way that stories were told? No. No. Uh, no. <laughs> Not at all. I thought we're gonna make a cute movie for ladies to go see with other ladies. And, uh, and so, you know, and that was the extent of it. It's, it's shot in 16 mil. I didn't even like, I'm like, yeah, super 16. I'm, we're not gonna convert. We're never gonna make a 35 mil copy of this movie. Right. That's how much I thought that, that's like the physical evidence of not thinking it would go anywhere. You know, there are um, 
like hundreds and thousands of good movies that don't get distribution, that don't, you know, that don't kind of see the light of day, and that's really a shame. And there's the moment that something hits at a moment when that thing is needed, and that was the moment that Go Fish came on board. It's a beautiful film, and it's got such an optimism. And it was, it, for me, it was having come through, I worked in a women's refuge in the early 80s, which was a feminist women's refuge, where we had to institute consensus minus one, because we had consensus, but there was one socialist feminist who wouldn't let us buy toilet paper. It was just that <laughs> it was all a particular kind. Anyway, so I, I felt that real sort of a, a, a tyranny of ideology. Mm -hmm. um, and what was so refreshing about your film is that it starts to actually really tackle that kind of hard line. Because there was that sort of earnestness and anger. But this is really a romantic, it's about love. Yeah. And it's yeah. about two unlikely people falling in yeah. love as well. And V.S. Brody is a very, you would, I doubt very much that you would see a character who looked like her mm -hmm. in a film now. And it was great that it felt, to me, I watched it and I thought, this feels like my friends, this feels like my, yeah. my people, and it feels very representative, but I loved the heart. Did you and Guinevere actually write together, or how, how would the writing of it actually work? We would do pages together. We would do things together, or ideas, and then we would, we would I would you know, take the pages, then she would take the pages. I would have to say that the best writing in the film is from Guinevere, which is that um, the the voiceovers and and you know like those yeah, things great, are, yeah. are just really her prose. Right. And uh, I remember uh, we used to get into classically gigantic fights, like pu public. She, I remember once in New in New York, she goes, she goes, you disgust me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was walking away from her, and she goes, you with the striped shirt. <laughs> And so what was the sort of, in, in real terms, like what, how much did the film make? How far did it travel? Well, for me, yeah. uh, the film made nothing for me. Um, right. But, you know, like, but um, overall it made, I think, close to five million. Oh, wow. Um, it was That's distributed really worldwide. Good. It was here, it was here, Dendi. Just drawing from that now, I'm just wondering, where do you think, uh, if you were to give advice to any LGBTQI filmmakers now, mm. Um, what, are there any lessons that can be drawn from your experience in terms of the financing or distribution or the actual um, technology for making things? What's really interesting and really exciting for me uh, now is it's a more even playing field a little bit because of technology. I mean, if you look at something like Tangerine, which is all shot on, on, on iPhones, um, I, I think you can learn how to edit yourself, like Premiere is worth it if you're, if you're an aspiring filmmaker in the room. That excites me, that sort of DIY kind of nature, like I have a story to tell and like some of us don't have ten good films in us, you know, some of us yeah. have one, you know, mm. I, that's the thing about making work is that like, I think you question every time and I, it, that's like a question for you, like when you have a, an amazing role, do you, is that the role or is that, you know, are there more, do you keep going on and on, you know what I mean? Some oh, well, I was, my thing was always novelty, you know. I, oh. I, I cannot stand to do the same thing over and over, I go nuts, so I'll always move on to some new thing and, no. um, you know, I'm always terrified that I'm not gonna be able to do it, but, but would rather that than be bored. So that's the thing that right. kind of impels me and that sense of curiosity and adventure and challenge, I think. Yeah. So then after the success of Go Fish, there were a number of opportunities. You did bedrooms and hallways, um, safety of objects. And so you must have had people uh, presenting you with opportunities. I think less than you would think. I was watching a, an interview with you and, 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 and someone had asked you about coming out and you mm. had said, like, I think I would have been put in a box. Right. Um, and, and I can't disagree with you. I think that what happened with me was that I was definitely put in a box. And I remember Dorothy was like, do you want to direct Carol? And I was like, no, I'm not going to do another gay movie. <laughs> you know, which is so very, I, I, I no longer shy away from it. I mean, you know, I, I, I kind of embrace it now. I'm just like, fine, that's who I am. That's right. who I am, that's what the majority of my work has been. Uh, the majority of my work has been about identity. And that's okay. But to me, I felt a little less than then. Really? You know, I felt a little bit like, oh God, I don't want to be like in the box. I don't want to be just, the, I want to be can a I, filmmaker, not I the gay you, filmmaker. Can I you, cannot fucking win. Because um, <laughs> I did the other thing, which is that I, I, I stayed, look, all my friends and family knew, no. but to the public I was in the closet and I went no. the way of, the, of following the mainstream success. No. And that, there was still, there's a, there's a part of me that grieves a lost part of my life. Because we came from that generation where um, you couldn't really be both. Like a successful lesbian out 
filmmaker who has all this you know amazing array of opportunities. I think it really. I don't even know that gay men in that in that same situation could could have both either. That's a, that's the <laughs> danger of identity politics, isn't it? Because yeah. you want to sort of you want to almost have a label in order to know who you are, and then you get freaking yeah. stuck with it. You know, in some ways. Yeah. So it's and then real... you've got to take the labels less seriously, which is kind yeah. of where I'm at right now. The thing is, I think you start to see it at the, as this polarizing thing. You're either this or you're that. Mm. And I think it's other things, perhaps, that are that you're putting on your own sexuality. That you know, like like other discontent. You know, I just had a birthday recently, and we we're just driving, you know, to San Francisco. My friend's like, you know what? I'm just going to see guys. It's easier, you know. And I'm just like. It's fine. I mean, that's cool. That's cool. But it's always like this kind of like, this is not working, so I'm going to do that. And, and, it's, and, and sometimes I'm just like, maybe that's an exploration of a, of a larger discontent. And maybe that's not, maybe just like flipping the, the coin is not, not the well, answer. I, I think that but the, I don't care who does, by the way. I mean, I, you do what you need to do. I, I don't. Happy, well, I, for you know. me, um, when I came out you know, to the broader public, um, I had to coin the phrase, you know, gay, 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 a little bit, not gay, 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 gay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because I felt that real responsibility in terms of, like, you know, say it's very unlikely, but say I did have a relationship with a man, I didn't want people going, oh, you know, she said she was a lezo, mm -hmm. and she's not, you know, all of that. I nonsense. love this country, lezo. Lezo. I'm bringing that back to the US. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be a big fat lezo. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Our contribution I'm going to make a t shirt yeah. for myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think, like, the gay community is very early in its. its stages of, of having a sense of itself as a community. And I think there's, personally, I think there's actually a lot of um, psychological damage and internalised homophobia. Like, we've gone from the discourse of shame to the discourse of pride with nothing but a freaking parade to get us mm -hmm. through. Um, and you look at what happened this week, as finally, are, are people going to now register that, that we actually are a, a persecuted group that experience violence? Because it does seem to be very difficult to get that, get that message across to people and to get them to care, mm. I think. You know, and as much as I would love to live in a world where one's own identity can be as fluid as you absolutely want it to be, I think it's why um, it's still important to stand up and be counted. I think yeah. it's why it's still important to have LGBTQIA, whatever, you know, and, and, and the rest of the alphabet festivals. And, mm. and those are spaces that I feel, that I feel very, very much that are, are still needed. I still like my gay bar to be gay. I still like my, you know, and I think that there's something very particular about this community and why I will, I will in all likelihood spend the rest of my life here. I think about those guys dancing at that club and yeah. I think to myself, they felt like they were with family. Mm. And that is something that, um, you know, that doesn't, sorry. <laughs> um, it's all right. You make no. me cry now. I think we're all feeling a bit like that. Really? Yeah. Well, I'm going to give you a hug. But I think yeah. the man. Oh. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah. You know, and that last night, um, my, new, my new friends were having a, a, a party, and it was just so beautiful. And I think, and I think to myself, like, what a privileged thing to be. What a privileged space to be in. And uh, I think of how proud I am to be uh, in that space. And to, on the night of you know, these people's death, to be celebrating. And to hold hands and be cheesy and sing and whip out some old dance moves. <laughs> and, uh, and to have that kind of shorthand, um, no matter where you go, I think, I think other people I don't know. I hope they have that, but I don't know that they have that, because we learn how to make family out of oh, our. Oh, and we're so selves. conscious of it and love. <laughs> you know, in terms of like the whole marriage equality thing, it's such a <clears throat> moribund institution, isn't it? And and I think um, uh, the LGBTQI community is reinvigorating it, whether it deserves it or not. But actually, um, making it. You know, I don't even know if I'm capable of it, but I will fight for the right to have it, because. It, we do have that um, resilience and um, with adversity that we've had to, many of us have lost families, have had to construct, no. don't even have freaking families, had to construct a family unit from out of nothing, mm -hmm. had to construct a community, had to construct no. safe places and it was an extraordinary thing. We're the king and queens of creating our own family. Yeah. But also um, 
taking hate and turning it into love. You look at what is thrown at us and, and the hatred that we get, and what do we do? We throw a freaking parade. <laughs> we don't go and get bombs. We nope. don't go and shoot people. We take that stuff and we dance and we make communities, we make families, we have children. We make films. We make films. So moving on to the... Oh, the, the L word. The L word. The L word. <laughs> I wish I would have created that show so I could be like, oh, I wish yeah, you would mine. have too, and I wish it was set in New York. But, but <laughs> um, so Eileen Chaikin, she had the, the idea, she was the showrunner. Yeah. And then she got you on board, because you directed the first episode, yeah? I directed the pilot, yeah. I remember this incredible sense of excitement seeing, uh -huh. I mean, it was a completely different representation of lesbians again. I really wanted the show to be like how we become each other's families and how we. Um, hold each other up and, and really kind of the community. Um, so then the, the question I think that probably everyone is wanting to know about, because um, yeah, sex in the show, uh -huh. it was a very hot show, it was a very sexy show. Have you got any good stories about the sex? Uh, it was all real. <laughs> <laughs> was, uh, but basically kind of how I knew how to do sex scene was like, here, drink this bottle of wine. And here you drink that bottle of wine. Now we're gonna turn the camera on and like, have at it, you know? <laughs> and like, you know, not do anything, like, to just really not direct it at all. You know, just be like, I don't know, I'm, I'll just be over here Did, with my bottle of wine. Wasn't that and, uh, <laughs> You know, but, uh, but it, was a, it was a real education to do, you know, like you really get over your, your shyness, you know, when you, when, yeah. you do, when you do a show like wasn't that. Wasn't there a sex bit that came on or something like that? I seem to remember reading. No, what I no? did, I gathered all the best sex scenes I could find, both, both straight and gay, that I found like in movies and stuff like that, and we compiled those into kind of a, a into sort of a sex bible. And uh, so you could go to the sex bible if you wanted uh, um, some, some tips or like how things are shot or you know like some things that that kind of work that were that were kind of cheesy i have to give credit to jennifer beals because it was jennifer who really kind of taught me how to to, to sort of like not and with with these words do you want me to have an orgasm and i'm like oh no uh, <laughs> i want you to um you know i don't know if you want you know it was kind of like i couldn't even look at her i was just like i don't know <laughs> And then she was just like, well, then just say, come on. Like, and she's like, and she's like, she's like just count me down. And so, uh, <laughs> so, and so I remember I set up like a 300 mil lens to be like far away from set, you know what I mean? And I had like curtains up and I'm like, okay, 10, <laughs> nine, <laughs> you know? And, and, and Jennifer's like, huh? you know, and I'm like, eight, let's see what happens, you know? It's like, did they uh, end up having sex fatigue by the end of the show? Like tired of just sick of doing the sex. No, things. but you know what was really funny about doing a show like that is I remember I had left I left the L word uh, after season three, and came back in season five to direct Liquid Heat, and in Liquid Heat was the episode where everybody had sex, and we were just like, how it all different? What do we do for everybody? Do we do different sex? And I'm like, I know. Let me be a purist. Everybody goes down on someone, <laughs> and that's like we're just gonna do the basic. We're gonna do. We're gonna go back old school. Classic, <laughs> classic lesbian sex, end to end. Put away that dildo. Straight lesbo sex. So, you know, it was a really interesting show to do because, like, I think a lot of women, we had a lot of guest stars on the show, and I think a lot of women were like, it's gonna, I'm gonna kiss my first girl, <laughs> you know? <laughs> They'd be like, is this my kissing scene yet? <laughs> you know? I was, I was just gonna... like, is my kissing scene now? Because, because you know? of course. They're like, who am I kissing? <laughs> Because a few, you know, a couple of decades earlier, it was a yeah. career killer for straight women to play yeah, gay yeah. women. But yeah, now yeah. they're kind of all chomping at the bit. Yeah, especially like the women, the so women in this. their 40s, you know. They were just like, I haven't done this yet. <laughs> I missed this in college. You this know, might like, be my or, last chance. Or I haven't done this since college, you know. Did you feel a great sense of responsibility to the audience? Or did you feel that you would just run the course that you were going to anyway? Was no. it interactive? Or? I left because I felt a great sense of responsibility to the audience. Right. I really and, did. And you felt the show was drifting away from what you thought it could be, or? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I tell you the thing I thought with it is that it was, it was great to see the lesbian sex, but mm. to me what I felt was missing was lesbian love, which I think is mm. almost more revolutionary mm. um, and, and more disruptive. You know, and, and I think there was this mandate to make it more and more fabulous and more and more pretty and more and more, more, more like dynasty more yeah more and more shiny yeah and i really wanted i really wanted something different um i'm going to move on now to what yeah. you're doing now in terms yeah. of that sense of like 
um, your artistic expression mm -hmm. and your sense of purpose because now you've moved again you're doing groundbreaking stuff mm -hmm. formally and content wise you've moved into the whole virtual reality space mm -hmm. which is extraordinary do you want to tell us a little bit about what how that started and what it involves and I like going back to zero I guess yeah and going and going into VR is sort of like going back to zero and sort of like trying to find who it is I was because there was someone that there's a way that I used to be. Because the VR stuff is amazing. Right. I've watched some of that today. Because yeah. you put the, the goggles on your face and it's not, it's not just like you, so, you sort of see around like this. It's a sphere. You look up, you look behind you, mm. you know, you look all around. Yeah. So it's a very immersive experience. Yeah, and, exactly. and a lot of people talk about it as, as a way of actually developing empathy. empathy yeah. Do you think that that has that potential? I certainly. I mean, I mean, the pieces, the the, the pieces, the part of perspective was really, really kind of using the the immersive uh, uh, nature of of virtual reality. Tell us to, what those two stories, the the the, yeah, the, what the story is about. To put yourself in someone else's shoes, you know, like kind of like first person point of view. And the first thing that uh, that I that that I that I really that had occurred to me was a, a sexual assault. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it was something that was kind of close to me because I I mean this this uh, something very similar had happened to me but in high school you know it, it's very interesting to me the casual nature of like kind of these things happening on college campuses and so I'm like oh, I'm gonna do a piece where you're both this this young man and this young woman at this party where uh, sexual assault occurs so you go through the you go through the experiences him and her and you don't go I mean you're doing, you know like I'm, it's a it's a it's, taste, it's a tasteful piece. Yeah. it's not I didn't want someone to get half a boner like watching that would have been so gross no but, and it doesn't yeah. it doesn't have yeah, that doesn't. at all it was really it was really very affecting and yeah. because there's that sort of 3D space mm -hmm. it is much more it's harder to have that sense of a distance you from it you can't get away from it no yeah. Yeah. no and the next series that I'm doing is called LGBTQIA which is a, a VR comedy about uh, about about a gay group, essentially, you know, oh, like a, community, a high school turned <laughs> community center at night where it's like, you know, it's like there's a misfit, like the bad news bears of the, of the gay group, you know, the <laughs> LGBTQIA group, and like half of them don't want to be there. Um, but in light of sort of what happened yesterday, um, I think that, I think that there's a different piece that I want to do now. Um, oh, yeah. I think I'm going to push the comedy for a year or for a, a little bit and put another piece prior to that. Where right. it's an immersive uh, experience about being, about being, uh, about the nature of being queer. I was, be I've just been very moved while I've been here. But as you were saying, you know, yesterday after Orlando happened, and mm. you said, um, because this is LGBTQI people, and because it's Latino people, you were wondering whether it would be given the same respect and the same commemoration yeah. had it been any other group of people, or whether the waters will close over. Um, and and maybe this will have shifted things a bit, but the work that you're continuing to do is certainly going to mm -hmm. um, keep pushing those boundaries. So on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for all you've oh done God, and will you. do. Thank you.